They systematic oppression on my European minority group until I violently uprise. So, it's late 19th century Spain. There was an ongoing conflict, one that had been fought by thousands, one that had gone on for many years, for the entirety of the 19th century. Liberals wanting to curtail the monarchy's power because we're doing democracy now, everybody, and conservatives trying to stop them. The nation had broken into three different violent civil wars known as the Carlist Campaigns, and there were a dozen coups between 1814 and 1874. The poor kept getting poorer, the rich kept getting richer, and Spain was tired and war-torn. This didn't end in the 19th century, though. An entire generation, an entire century of people knew nothing but this, and it boiled over into the 20th century. The 20th century showed no signs of things getting better. In 1909, the tragic week happened, where basically every political entity ever got together and tried to fight the monarchy. As evidenced by the name, it didn't work out so well. Spain remained neutral in World War I because the war Spain was fighting at the time was one to stay together. But World War I came and passed, and things didn't change. And then the 20s roared in, and people finally took arms against the government in Madrid. In 1923, Miguel Primo de Rivera successfully overthrew the government and installed his own military dictatorship, which is destined to end well. In 1931, his military dictatorship was mysteriously losing support, though, and King Alfonso XIII used his royal power to install the Second Spanish Republic, which lasted a whopping five years into 1936. With the Great Depression in full and harsh swing, and the rising threat of fascism, because <laughs> isn't that super fun to deal with, kids? We finally get to the thing that causes the thing that I plan on talking about in this video, which is the Spanish Civil War. Now, the Spanish Civil War is this huge and complex historical topic, and I'm only really going to be briefly touching on it, so bear that in mind. Not a full explanation. But basically, there's two main factions in the Spanish Civil War. There's the Populists, and there's the Nationalists. Now, everyone left-leaning was on the Populist front, everyone right-leaning was on the National front. And you might think, oh, that's not so bad, except for the fact that the Fascists were right-leaning. And that meant that this was another one of those wars against fascism that may or may not fail. Now, the populists and the nationalists fought bitterly. And many people internationally went to Spain to fight for the populist front because they believed in what they were doing. The issue is other fascist nations like Italy wanted, you know, an ally. And Germany wanted an ally. So Italy sent armies and, and Germany sent money. And this meant that the populists were a group of rebels, and the nationalists were a properly supplied military, which obviously is not going to end well. Now, Francisco Franco was the leader of the Nationalist Front, and he won the Civil War in 1939, utilizing brutal and bloody tactics. And so, fascism was installed in Spain. But the issue is, fascism needs an other group, an out-group. People that you demonize and hurt and kill. And though populist losses totaled in the 100,000 range, it was not enough for the nationalists. Franco installed himself as leader of Spain and kicked off his regime with the slaughter of 28,000 populist members. After them, it was any leftist, followed then by teachers and poets. Franco gave lists of Jews over to Germany, and while nonviolent, he certainly did aid the Axis. Franco, unfortunately, though, maneuvered just right to keep right-leaning groups in line, declaring Spain a monarchy to appease the Carlists, who had, who had plunged the nation into war three different times last century. And he did create a puppet parliament to appease hardcore Republicans, forget this, corporate interests. Now, even though he was certainly aligned with the far-right Axis, he stayed out of World War I, being the most powerful dictator of the time by keeping his head down. Uh, the funny Adolf guy that I probably shouldn't say his name shot himself like a bitch that he was, and Mussolini was publicly executed, but Franco kept on ruling, and such a regime would not exist without resistance. In the 1940s, no nation wanted to be associated with Spain due to their support of the Axis. Even if Franco hadn't fought, he had helped. Seeing the nation again in depression, 
He changed up the regime, abandoning near-isolationist ways and allowing the Spanish miracle to happen. Spain's economic growth through the 50s and 70s under Franco's, under Franco's rule was rivaled only by Japan. It was clear. The regime wasn't going anywhere. In the 1950s, a student group called Akin started a magazine wanting to take direct action. Akin were a Bosque group, and for those who don't know, the Bosques are a group of people between France and Spain. They were their own group of tribes before the Romans, and then the Romans came and fucked that up for them, and after the Roman Empire, the Bosques formed their own kingdoms, and then the French and the Spanish came and ruined that for them. Uh, the Bosques were their own cultural identity, and were also on the losing side of the Spanish Civil War, earning them a shit ton of bombs and violence against them, because it's a civil war, what else would you expect? They had lost not only for supporting the populists, but for attempting to found their own nation. The Bosques are a consistent undercurrent in Spanish history. They had been conquered by Spain, but as Spain crumbled, they attempted to break free, and during two of the three Carlist campaigns, they tried to found their own nation. The Bosques did not want to be a part of Spain, at least so many that a sizable portion of them were willing to die for it. They had their own culture, their own language, and they wanted out. And knowing what we know about Spain as it stands, we know that shit there is not really good for anyone in this time in history. Akin, being a Bosque nationalist group, had a goal. Create a Bosque nation. Rather, realize Vasconia, the supposed Bosque nation that had existed briefly during some of the wars. They aren't to be confused with Frente Nacional, which is the Spanish nationalists of the Civil War, as they were Spanish nationalists and fascists. And the Akin is a communist national group more aligned with the populists. Although there were already parties dedicated to Basque nationalism, Akin found them frequently frustrated with the Congressional Basque Nationalist Party's moderate stances and utter inefficiency. Any party allowed by Franco was just not going to be capable of instituting the kind of change they needed. And the Basque National Party was often involved in the suppression and oppression of Basque people and culture, an arm of the state to make an unruly group conform. In 1959, Akin would become ETA, standing for, I'm gonna butcher this, Yuskari Ta Akatsuna. Yuskari Ta Akatsuna which in English translates to Bosque Homeland and Liberty. In 1962, ETA would hold their first assembly in Bayonne, France. And here the movement would announce itself politically. Remember, the Bosques were on the losing side of the Civil War. While the populists lost, the people did not lose these communistic and socialistic ideals. They did not lose the desire to be their own nation, and so the ETA was a very left-aligned movement at the start of everything. And by that I mean they were communists. They were straight-up communists who wanted nothing to do with Russia and America's pissing match. And uh, that was a good thing for them. In 1963, the book Vasconia would be released by Frederick Krutwig, and this is described as the defining text of the movement. For all intents and purposes, Vasconia, a nation formed briefly during Spanish civil wars and that existed before Spain conquered it, never stopped existing. Vasconia in 1937 never died according to the ETA, it was merely being occupied by a foreign power. Anyone who sympathized with the Bosque plight was welcome to join. The ETA also directly called for the church to be uninvolved in the state, a direct call out to Franco who tried integrating his special version of Catholicism into the government operations. And most intelligently, the ETA knew and accepted that direct military confrontation was out of the realm of possibility. To fight Spain openly would not only be fighting Spain, it would also be fighting America. See, Franco's hatred of communists proved to be rather useful to America during this strange period of time of history known as the Cold War. And because of that, the U.S. just was not going to let Franco fail. They helped him out. Now, the rest of Europe did not particularly like Franco. A dictator was not something these countries were too keen on having on their borders. Again, France especially wary in remembering the last dictatorship to share a border with, allowed the ETA to roam freely within France. They wouldn't send anyone back. They wouldn't... Hands off, right? The ETA can do whatever as long as they don't break French law. And the ETA took massive advantage of this. Remember, the Bosque peoples were split between France and Spain. 
And though French Bosques were relatively non-politicized, they still were allies to the Spanish Bosques, who needed allies. The French government, aware that the ETA was directly attempting to undermine Franco, just kind of gave them a th thumbs up and a gold star and told them to do whatever. So the ETA sent operatives they deemed key for their operations to gain combat experience in places like Algeria. They brokered deals with anyone, especially other rebel groups like the IRA, and uh, they armed themselves. Lastly, they operated in cells. ETA cells consisted of locals to an area receiving orders from an entirely disconnected leadership. And this meant that if a group of ground fighters were caught, the rest of the organization was safe. It wouldn't be threatened. This made the ETA like a hydra, chop off its head and two more will appear. At the start of all of this, the ETA was organized, meticulously planned, and armed. The ETA continued to hold assemblies, attempting to define a clear goal of exactly what they wanted and how they wanted it, and they set up things like contraband rings to fund themselves. Now, of course, around the time that I'm describing all of these things, Francisco Franco started enforcing crackdowns against the ETA, viewing them as a threat. And this takes us to 1968, when Civil Guard member Jose Arque attempted to stop founding member of the ETA Tixabiax Tiberieta, and I'm so sorry if I get these pronunciations wrong. I really am trying, but I do not know Bosque. It is this very linguistically unique thing. Anyways, <clears throat> Tixabi shot RK and ran. At this point, the ETA had not yet decided if any kind of conflict was how they were going to do things, because, as we've already established, open conflict is a bad idea. Now, Tixabi only shot because he feared that he and his companion were found out to be ETA members. And of course, Tixabi would not escape this shooting with his life. His death pushed the ETA into retaliation. They organized the assassination of the leader of Franco's secret police, Meliton Manzanas. In response, the Francoist government would condemn a group of arrested ETA members to the death penalty. The ETA was not a group to be outplayed, though, and they responded by kidnapping a German man and holding him hostage. Their terms were simple. If Franco had the ETA members killed, they would kill the German, and Germany had a really tense relationship with Spain already. So, Franco instead relegated the sentences down to lower things, and the ETA would release their hostage in December of 1970. The 70s marked a strenuous time for the ETA, though. Not every member was a communist, and that had formerly been okay, but the non-communists of the movement eventually decided that fighting and dying for a communist nation was not ideal, so they split off to form the ETA V, being largely militant, and this is for ETA of the 5th Assembly, but we're just going to mark them using Roman numerals because that's easier to say. Now, ETAV was largely militant. They were the spearhead, and the rest continued on as ETAVI. And both groups did serve the same goal for the most part, but the, but the ETAV upped the ante, robbing munitions cases and banks, Im intimidation and more. The ETAVI, with its further left ideology, would eventually become the LCR ETAVI, or, I'm gonna look at my script to read this, the Revolutionary Communist League of the Sixth Assembly of Bosque Liberationists. This name, of course, is a fucking mouthful, and eventually it was changed and disbanded to become just the LCR, so that non-Bosque people would be willing to join. Back to the ETAV, which goes on to become the only ETA. When the 70s came, they came with more skirmishes and casualties. And after this moment of weakness, of, you know, getting shot up and, oh god, we have to shoot people now, and beyond the gunshots, there was a golden opportunity for something great to happen. Operation or go. Francisco Franco was old. He was not going to be able to keep his wits sharp and his nation strong. He had found a successor in Luis Carrero Blanco, Blanco was everything Franco wanted Spain to keep being. He was a fervent and devout Catholic supporting Opus Dei, Franco's special little flavor of Catholicism. He believed in many of the same economic policies and rights policies. Blanco was a little, little guy who's going to be just like Franco. Maybe that wasn't a good thing. So imagine yourself, two decades into a losing war, casualties are mounting, and the opposition is cracking down. You need to win, but you can't face an army, and you can't alert the Americans. For the Basque nation to be realized, 
the Spanish nation was going to need to fall apart. Operation Orgo was an attempt to start a race war. Operation Orgo, being what it is, seems a little spooky, but what's the plan? Assassinate Luis Carrero Blanco. Every single Sunday, Blanco took the same path to the same church down the same streets in Madrid. This is not a good thing to do when you want to live. In April of 1973, the ETA commando unit Tixicchia rented the basement apartment of Cali Claudio Coelho 104, right on the route Blanco took to church every Sunday. Commandos claimed they were sculptors, and they began the long process of sculpting, which really means tunneling out into the street and moving the rock out. Now, after they tunneled under the street, they, which they did without being caught somehow, it was December. And on December 20th of 1973, Blanco became an airman. 180 pounds of the explosive Goma 2 launched Blanco's Dodge Dart 66 feet into the air. Blanco flew over his church and landed on the other side of it on a second story terrace. And sure, every person in the car survived the flight and the blast, but they succumbed the same day to their injuries in various hospitals. Simply put, Francoist Spain had lost its head. Franco took back over, but Franco was like a Ford after hitting 150,000 miles, which is to say, on its dying legs, about to give out. And yeah, Franco wanted the ETA dead for what they had done to his heir and his government. There was no one else to continue Francoist Spain as he wanted. From 1973 to 1975, Francisco Franco got violent. He wanted the ETA gone. The ETA had to get violent in response. In 1975, when Francisco Franco died, Juan Carlos I, a member of the long-ousted Spanish family, returned home, returned to his throne. But it's the 80s. Monarchy is no longer a feasible form of government. Come on now. So Juan Carlos set up the Kingdom of Spain. And the Kingdom of Spain lasted from 1975 until 1981, but Juan Carlos was really only in charge from 1975 to 1978, wherein what he did was set the nation up as a democracy before abdicating the throne. Neither the ETA or the Francoists were done, though. They were already okay with being violent by 1973, but in 1974 and 75, they had to spiral into that to survive. So, of course, in 1975, when everything chills out, they're a little bit thrown off. And then, the Spanish government offers an armistice and pardons for the ETA in 1978, provided that they just lay down their guns. Looking in from the outside, it seems a bit stupid that they didn't stop then. I mean, they had accomplished so much. Maybe they should try a new strategy. But imagine you're an ETA operative who's been in since the 60s. You've watched your group collapse in on itself and branch apart and break. You've had comrades die. Your biggest enemy is dead. And the nation you want your land to be free from is on its knees. They didn't lay down their guns. They turned the safety off. It's here that the ETA goes from a noble freedom fighter group to a terrorist organization in many people's eyes. The line was already hazy, but 1978 marked the deadliest year for the ETA yet. The world was undecided about New Spain. Spain was undecided about the New Spain, and that meant the ETA could emerge without the fear of dropping the weight of America directly on their head. And so they did. 1979 was more deadly, and 1980 more deadly than that. The end of Francoist Spain started what is now known as the Dirty War. Now, here's where it gets really silly for some additional context, because what Juan Carlos did was unexpected. Bear in mind, the monarchists had ripped Spain apart like four or five different times in its history, three times within the last two centuries to keep being a monarchy. When Franco declared Spain a monarchy, he only did so if he could mentor Juan Carlos in the ways of fascism. When Juan Carlos returned to the throne and was in favor of democracy, the Francoists felt betrayed. They were pissed. Because Juan Carlos is supposed to be on our side, guys. So the Francoists try to overthrow the young government, but support for Francoism was dead spare for the fanatics. Fascism was over. 
Some of these fascists and more conservative-leaning people started a group called the GAL, a counter-terrorist group dedicated to avenging the deaths of those the ETA killed and eventually stopping the ETA. The government, seeing that having armed groups running around shooting each other uh, was a problem, but not exactly intending to defend the ETA, offered amnesty to any who renounced violence publicly. The ETA was facing a war of survival on multiple fronts. And of course, once again, the ETA had split into two groups. ETA-M for those who prefer violence be used, and ETA-PM for those who didn't prefer that. Now, while we are still on the late 70s fog, let it be known that Spain refused any of the five demands for ETA amnesty, which involved egregious ideas like better rights for workers and the right to self-determination for the Basque peoples. They aren't exactly good guys, but there aren't exactly any kind of good guys here. And of course, in Madrid, things got blurry, lines got crossed again, as new anti-terrorism laws, the likes of which Franco probably smiled upon from hell, were passed. And so, of course, start the car bombings. One last split to start off the 80s with a bang. The ETA-PM accepted amnesty in exchange for freedom of Basque prisoners. Those who did not like this deal in the 8th Assembly went on to join the ETA-M, which goes on to be the only ETA. It's like the 70s split, but way worse. Also to kick off the 80s, the GAL wasn't doing what they said they were. Big shocker, they were really just engaging in lethal racism, torturing and killing Basque people they suspected to be related to the ETA with little evidence. This conflict remains complex, though, as a major reason the ETA continued their resistance after the 80s had come through was that 75% of Basque voters agreed to the Constitution, but by my research, I could be completely wrong on this, only around 30% of Spanish Basques were able to vote. Now, I have a hard time finding concrete sources on this, but I think this bizarre skew, if it is in fact true, comes from a systematic oppression against the Basques. The disproportionate arrests, the language barriers compared to Spain, and it didn't help that Amnesty International was ignoring ETA reports of abuse and torture at the hands of the government before the 80s. The ETA saw themselves as freedom fighters. In 1984, literally 1984 though, the ETA would lose one of their greatest supporters. The GAL, with the backing of Spanish secret services, would wage war against the ETA, and this boiled over into France with 26 assassinations happening in a year there. For decades, the ETA had been able to roam freely through French lands, but the French government under Pierre Hoxé was not willing to have Spanish conflict within their borders. Nope. After some 25 years of having access, France agreed to extradite known and suspected ETA members to Spain. Simply put, the ETA was running out of places to go. With increasing conflict, in 1985, the ETA would plant a car bomb, yay, baby's first car bomb, in Madrid, killing a single American and injuring 16 others. In the same year, they would enter public shootouts with the military. In 1986, the ETA bleeding members and sinking like a failed submarine from 2023 instituted two new traditions. Firstly, no other Basque nationalist group was to be allowed to operate or exist while the ETA was there. And secondly, deserters were to be shot. Maria Dolores Catarain, a former ETA operative who had left the life to raise her son and be a mother, was shot in the street in front of her infant. In 1987, the ETA bombed a shopping center in Barcelona, killing 21 and injuring 45. This action and the assassination of Maria Catarain resulted in an outcry from Basque peoples, causing every single Basque political party but Harry Batasuna to sign the Ajira and Neoa Pact against the ETA, essentially declaring that Basque people and politicians wanted nothing to do with them. The ETA had lost themselves so thoroughly in the last decade that the very people they were fighting for wanted them to stop. But downward spirals like this don't stop. They don't end, they get worse. In 1988, two things happened. The ETA called for a ceasefire for the first time, and Spain changed their reinsertion policy. The reinsertion policy was the policy of amnesty being granted to ETA members who publicly renounced violence. Spanish officials realized that the optics of this didn't work if every time some person said, 
the ETA is cringe, that same person got shot in public later. So they started transferring ETA members to prisons all over the country in hopes that reinserting them away from their former operatives would help. Bosque people didn't like this though, claiming it was unfair to send Bosques so far from home, but at this point so many Bosques had been arrested as part of the ETA that there was a sizable ETA population in literally every prison in Spain, and avoiding any more defectors getting shot was beneficial. Back to that ceasefire though. Over the course of a few months, the two groups would try and fail to come to peaceful conclusion. The 90s did start with one good thing for the ETA, and that was the end of the Dirty Wars. Spanish journal El Mundo aired the state connection to GAL, and Spanish officials responsible for funding the racist terror group were arrested. That was in 1990. 1991 was a quiet year. The Spanish government was making their final preparations to drop a bomb on the ETA. Remember how the ETA functions multiple cells receiving orders from afar. It's like a hydra. Arrest or kill one cell and two more will be there to replace it, receiving orders. The ETA was led, though, by three men known as the Art Apollo Collective. Paquito led the military, Tixelis led the politicians, and Fite controlled logistics. Without any of these three members, the ETA would not be able to function. Spain wasn't aiming for the head this time. Spain was aiming for the heart. So in 1992, in the Basque town of Bidart, Spanish officials caught the Art Apollo Collective. The remaining members of the ETA grew more extreme and more violent as a result of this, taking to recruiting children, inciting riots and vandalism, and general pandemonium. What they were fighting for was now lost as well. They were fighting just to fight. They planted bombs, but due to the fact that pretty much all of the experienced members were gone, a lot of these failed. Others didn't, though. Spain had won at this point regardless of any bombs or riots or kids recruited, however. And in 1995, the new leaders of the ETA called a ceasefire and tried to push the democratic alternative. Basically, just give Bosques the right to self-determination free of Spain, and they would quit forever. Spain once again denied these terms, citing the fact that King Juan Carlos I had written this possibility out of the constitution of the country when he wrote it in 1978. As a result, the ETA would try and fail to assassinate the king and a conservative politician, Jose Maria Anazar. After these failed attempts, they would resort to kidnapping and ransoming a beloved councilman by the name of Miguel Angel Blanco. They demanded every ETA operative be returned to Basque prisons in two days, or they would shoot him. The Spanish government didn't budge, and they didn't do anything. And shit hit the fan when the ETA shot the second Blanco. Thousands of Bosques took to the street protesting the ETA. People were losing respect. People didn't have any fear of them anymore. And so their slogan made their sentiment clear. Bosques, yes. ETA, no. In 1997, Spain passed another anti-terrorism law mandating that all terrorists be tried in the capital at Madrid, preventing any local judges or lawyers from having any sway over ETA court cases. And the 2000s brought the death knell for the ETA. They started acting so boldly because they felt they no longer had to fear being stomped out by America. If they could be ignored by the world's greatest empire, there was a chance because almost no group could ever stand up to the CIA and survive. But keep America out of it, keep the CIA away, and everything's gonna be fine, it's all gonna work out. Of course, they failed to keep the CIA away. And it wasn't any failure on their behalf, it was because September 11th happened. To say the American government was pissed was an understatement. They took a severe stance against terrorism, funding countless operations against it, and also freezing and watching bank accounts. America was involved because America needed a war that could last forever, and that war was against terror. The ETA lost access to its funds because America as a banking power had shut them down. Spain as an ally had gained better technologies and strategies against the ETA. If Spain won the war against the ETA in 1992, Spain started kicking the dead horse in 2001, and any nation formerly even slightly sympathetic to the ETA cause wasn't allowed to do that openly anymore. Harry Batasuna, the last bastion of the ETA in politics, was outlawed. 
Jirai, the Basque nationalist group and recruitment center for the ETA, was outlawed. Not to mention, Jose Maria, the guy that they tried and failed to kill, became president. The ETA was getting arrested in droves. The ETA tried to keep talks going, but it was over. In 2011, they declared a permanent end to armed activities, and in 2018, they declared a cessation of all political activity. Nowadays, the ETA is known by Bosques and Spaniards alike as a group of feral dogs whose only good deed was ending fascism in Spain. The story of the ETA isn't one of noble intent and easy to appreciate and love freedom fighters. Don't get me wrong, I am absolutely for standing up to all forms of fascism current or past, but these guys just straight up wanted to start a race war. The ETA was doomed at the Fifth Assembly when the idealists left. A group of fighters with no idealists will be remembered as terrorists, and a group of idealists with no fighters will be remembered as deluded. And we saw that happen here to the ETA with their long and prolonged spiral down, down into something that the founding members probably wouldn't even recognize. Maybe if they didn't fracture, maybe if they had accepted Juan Carlos I's amnesty, maybe in a thousand ways they could have realized Vasconia. Or maybe it was always going to be car bombs and failed assassinations. Few pleasures are as fine in life as when you put on a suit and it fits better than the last time you wore it. Now you might be wondering to yourself, Mr. Another Pan, are you really wearing a sport jacket with nothing beneath it? To which I would say, Psh, yes, yes I am. So, you made it to the end of the video. You made it to the little post credit scene. Yay! First of all, I would like to say thank you so much for watching all the way through this video. It really does mean the world to me. This is probably the longest video essay I've ever typed up. And this is the kind of stuff that I want to keep making, you know? Editing was an absolute just slog to get through, but it was really worth it, and it was really fun, and I really had a blast with it, and I would like to keep doing it. And of course, I can't do that without support from you, so pat yourself on the back. You made it to the end of the video. Thank you so much. Now, of course, there's some other stuff to talk about. Uh, some of you might be, you know, this might be your first video you're seeing back from me, and you might be like, Mr. Another Pen, where the fuck were you? Uh, which, long story, I should have made a video on that by the time this video comes out. But, you know, it's me, so you can imagine bizarre shenanigans and stunning amounts of interpersonal tragedy involved, because that's what it always is. And of course, lastly, but never leastly, huge thanks to the patrons. Without the patrons, I there's been a few times that I've been real broke. There's been a few times I've been real broke and I'm like, ah oh, man, the Patreon money is the only reason I have gas in my tank right now. So that actually does directly help. Now, does it mean that I will start uploading regularly? Provided that the never-ending train wreck that is my life slows down a little bit? Yes, yes it does. I'm really going to be doing my best to be coming back into this full force, full swing, whole hog, you know, just maximum cock. So, yes, subscribing to the Patreon does help. It does incentivize me to make more videos, and I don't mean to, like, dangle, give me money, and I'll make more videos in front of you, but I'm also a, a absurdly broke 20-year-old guy, so... Yay! Either way, that's not what's important here. What's important here is that you made it to the end of this motherfucking video. Thank you so much. It really does mean the world. I'm glad that you could be here. Have a great time. And until next time, memento mori.